Uh, welcome everyone to day four of the 2020 um, annual meeting, the Alliance 2020 annual meeting. Um, can everyone here see, okay, some thumbs up, some little emojis. Yes, very good. Uh, my name is Leal Saru, I'm your host today. Um, today is our strategy session. Um, I will get into what that means a little bit later, but um, just to start, we're going to give you a quick rundown of the day. So we have this opening plenary, uh, then you're going to go into the rooms uh, for about an hour to uh, do some group work. Uh, this is where we will have the breakouts. So French, Arabic, and Spanish in rooms three, four, and five. Um, you have a 20 minute break at 310, followed by um, a small session here all together, and then back into the rooms, same language breakdowns, a shorter break, uh, and then we start wrapping up the day. Um, for those, again, who want to do the language breakouts, if you could please change your names uh, to have them reflect that. So you do that by either going to the little image of your, uh, of your video, um, clicking on the three dots or the word more, uh, and then you should have a little menu that pops up. It says rename, so I'm going to rename myself right now, Leal, Arabic, um, and that will help the producers know um, where to send you when we get to that stage. Um, before we carry forward, just a couple, um, a few really guidance rules to sort of ensure we have a productive day. Um, let's be respectful. We, I think most of us are of each other's opinions. Um, please keep your phones off and when you're not speaking um, and when you're not in a small group, if you could also keep your, um, uh, yourself on mute, that would be very helpful. Uh, we are going to try our best to stay on time, a little clock running. Um, and we ask you to participate. Uh, this has been really great all week. We've been very encouraged and we hope it continues today. Today's session um, completely hinges on everyone participating. So um, keep your mind, you know, when you're in groups, um, mics off. Uh, if you wanna speak in the plenary, there's the hands, uh, the little raise hand function. Um, last but not least, uh, the video. We understand for some the video uh, is too uh, taxing on the systems and therefore you, you're audio only, but if you can, please, please, please do not leave your friends hanging out by themselves in the room with a bunch of black screens. And let's face it, this is usually the facilitator and the producer surrounded by a bunch of black screens. We would love to see you all. It's so much better. We could take one of these cheesy photos as like a child protection community. Um, so yeah, please, if you can turn your videos on, uh, it really helps um, to give a sense of togetherness um, and you won't look as supernatural as these people. They're just in a, some artistic effect uh, for privacy reasons. Um, and then we've mentioned it a couple times, but if you do want to speak um, Arabic, French or Spanish uh, during the breakouts later on, please change your name. Uh, and put which language there so that the producers um, can more easily send you to your group. Um, oops, um, this is, we're just gonna stay here for a bit. Uh, so that said, um, I welcome you all again to today, day four, which we are going to focus on the strategy. Um, some of you may know, uh, but I think for many, this is probably the first time you'll hear that the Alliance is planning, uh, is entering its new strategic planning process to put together its next strategy. Um, and whereas strategic planning processes sometimes can often start at the top and sort of trickle down and then you find out, oh, your new priorities for the next three years are X, Y, and Z. Um, we're taking a different approach and starting that process through this consultation today with everyone participating in the annual meeting. And so we are hoping to have some good discussions uh, with colleagues today to talk about your work, wherever that is, wherever you're based, please fill out the poll so we have a sense. Um, and we can talk about some of the things that you experience, uh, some of the challenges that you would like addressed, things that you think we as a sector, as a child protection and humanitarian action community uh, need to collectively work on to improve. Um, and then what you think our priorities should be collectively. So that, those questions um, and, and that sort of sense of what the community should do together is going to guide us um, throughout today. And uh, without further delay, um, we're going to start with a discussion. Um, and so I'm going to 
invite the producers to, to do their magical thing um, while I introduce you to our three discussants as part of the, uh, for the next 15 minutes or so. Um, I have the great pleasure of introducing uh, three friends who I've met overseas and really wish we were together in person, but video really helps with this. Um, Tasha Gill is the uh, Child Protection in Emergencies, um, getting the titles wrong, I'm so sorry, <laughs> team lead, it's too early, um, and, and um, at UNICEF, and Anita Cuellaza is the uh, Child Protection and Emergencies Lead at Plan International, and Riyad Al Najm is the Haras Executive Director. I apologize for the titles, guys, I really should have gotten that. <laughs> Um, but they're going to join me right now and we're going to have a small discussion um, to reflect back on these um, last few years as a, a child protection sector uh, and also where the Alliance has uh, sort of began and come to. Um, and then afterwards, uh, we will look forward to the next, to the next uh, part of our day. So Tasha, Anita and Riyadh. Anyway, I was saying uh, thanks Ayal and actually thanks for uh, saying my surname in the correct way. Um, it's very difficult to do so. Uh, thanks also um, Hani, uh, Audrey and Ayal for inviting us today. We are really super happy to be able to start this very important day which will be focused on the strategic priorities of the Alliance. So without further delay, I'm going to start this session by asking my colleague Tasha that I can't see, but uh, Tasha, uh, you have been working in the child protection sector for a while and uh, um, we would really like to hear from you what you think are the changes that have uh, occurred in the sector and particularly within the Alliance in the last few years. Thanks, Anita. It's great to be here. Thanks, everyone. I mean, the first thing that I would say is growth. The Alliance has grown so much in the past few years. You know, in 2016, the Child Protection Working Group, as it was at the time, had 48 members. It had 15 steering committee members, and none of those were national organizations. Today, 2020, the Alliance counts 125 members. That's including 18 steering committee members, and three of those are national organizations. And in fact, what I'd like to highlight here is that over 65% of the general members of the Alliance are national and local organizations. Um, and these numbers point to the expansive growth of the Alliance. And perhaps due to that growth or perhaps a contributing factor to that growth is really the visibility, the increased visibility of the Alliance. I mean, I think we saw that this year very clearly with the leadership on COVID-19, but also in the norm setting work, the advocacy work, um, the Alliance is increasingly visible in everything that it's doing and relied upon by many around the world, um, as we've seen this week. The second thing I wanna to talk to is coherence and the strategic plan that the Alliance has and what we'll be revisiting today, developed in a consultative process, guides all of our work. Um, and I think that's really important to get that structure and that vision. It informs the work of the working groups and task forces. Um, and so in addition to that, that structure, that vision, the leadership, we're also working towards coherence across settings and across populations. And I know it's been said before, but I think it's important to underline that the integration of refugee children and their specific considerations is such an important part of that coherence that the Alliance is really providing to child protection work in all humanitarian settings and beyond. Um, and then the last thing that I highlight is the strategic <coughs> shift, as I call it. Um, the work of the Alliance has expanded the responsiveness of the child protection emergencies work to include prevention and really focus on prevention in the first place and the promotion of well being. This is incredibly important in terms of the implications for scale of our work, but also for policy. And so these three things are what I would highlight myself in terms of some of the shifts of the evolution of the Alliance over the past few years. Um, but what about you, Anita? I mean, there certainly there are other things that you'd like to highlight in terms of key achievements of the Alliance. Sure, thanks, Tasha. Um, I also have a few achievements I would like to highlight. Um, and the first one is very much related to what you were saying, uh, Tasha, about the strategic shift, shift. So I actually would like to talk about how the Alliance was able in the past three years to strengthen its multi-sectorial collaboration. And why this is related to the strategic shift, because uh, um, we really started to um, 
see child well-being, child development, and child health at the center of humanitarian action with all sectors contributing to it. There are several examples uh, that I could talk about of how the Alliance has collaborated with other sectors, but maybe the most significant one uh, is, uh, um, comes from education. I think you recall, uh, uh, it was probably two years ago, um, we, the Alliance together with INE organized a joint meeting in Nairobi. Um, in that occasion, child protection education practitioner came together to really discuss uh, um, opportunities and challenges for collaboration. And one of the recommendations that came out from that meeting was to develop a um, joint integrated child protection education framework. This is an activity that is currently ongoing. More recently, child protection and education actors came together to develop some uh, guidance during the response to COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and also, and this is something that is very close to my heart, together with education actors, we look at uh, competencies uh, that are required to child protection education actors to be able to um, support cross-sectorial collaboration. So this is, was the first achievement. I hope I still have time to mention a second one, which is, uh, um, which is about all the efforts that the Alliance uh, uh, made over the last few years to um, really increase the accessibility to technical products for all child protection practitioners. So um, over the past few years, the Alliance developed several technical resources in different formats. We have a, a webinar, podcast, we have uh, written pieces of guidance, we have evidence synthesis. So I think uh, it's important to highlight that uh, the Alliance together with uh, its working group and task forces really work hard to try to accommodate different learning styles, different learning preferences, different language skills, different ways to engage with technical material. And one thing we can really be proud of is our response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, throughout the pandemic, the Alliance really played a crucial role as a convener for the sector. And I would say not just for uh, humanitarian actors, but also for development actors. And uh, um, it was extremely useful to be able to access uh, all the resources that the Alliance uh, uh, put together. And if you think about all these webinars and podcasts where country practitioners were invited to share uh, their experience and challenges, um, it was uh, really useful. And uh, all these happened quite timely and early on in the response at a time when uh, all of us were really looking for examples on uh, um, how to adapt uh, um, programming. And so connected to this, the last point I want to make, I think this really highlights the strength the Alliance has uh, and its ability to really mobilize uh, individuals like us uh, who are coming from different settings with different expertise, uh, dif different background, but we all come together uh, with the same objective to enhance uh, and contribute to sector learning. So Riyadh, talking about uh, achievements, um, would you like to explain how the Alliance facilitated the inclusion of uh, national uh, organization and smaller group into the global interagency scene? Thank you. Thank you so much, Anita, and uh, hello, everyone. Let me start by uh, like uh, mentioning a uh, very short story. Uh, back in 2017, during the annual meeting, there was a discussion between, uh, I think, Hani, Audrey, and a colleague from um, a national NGO. And something that uh, this colleague said, like, uh, had a huge shift uh, um, in the localization agenda within the alliance. He said, a national NGOs on the alliance. And since then, we've seen like a huge focus from the uh, uh, Alliance on the localization as an agenda. As Tasha said before, like 65% of the members now are coming from local NGOs and uh, three uh, um, national NGOs sit on the steering committee where they have uh, equal vote and voice to uh, some of the leading organizations uh, on the international level in child protection. Um, 
We also have seen during the last three years the birth of the localization task force uh, where, where its main agenda is to uh, focus on the inclusion and participation of national NGOs as well as mapping their experiences so the alliance can build upon in the future. We've also seen a higher rate of participation uh, in working group and task forces uh, from the national NGO sides. And this especially include the development of materials, uh, translation and editing of uh, papers, and even uh, leading uh, field testing and uh, community consultations where national NGOs would do best. Um, we've seen also great initiatives uh, from uh, national NGOs when it comes to dissemination of knowledge and um, uh, the rollout of, of uh, uh, materials like the uh, CPMS. Um, I think we've had like so much work around localization through, during the last three years that I'm tempted to, to call it the, the era of localization within the Alliance. Thanks for that, Riyadh, and thanks for your leadership in that. Um, it's great to hear, but what about the challenges? I mean, certainly there are also challenges to this. Yeah, of course, uh, even though we've done a huge work, we still face some difficulties. For instance, uh, now only uh, uh, one local NGO uh, within the Alliance uh, co-leads a, uh, a, a, a working group. Um, we, um, and this is like mainly because like of lack of resources, which I, I may shed the light on uh, in a bit. We've also uh, faced some challenges to maintain uh, um, active engagement of, of, um, of local NGOs in working group and uh, task forces. And this is again, like due to uh, um, difficulties in, in accessing resources, um, time, lack of time, and, and uh, uh, the poor internet access that local NGOs usually have. Uh, in the localization group, um, uh, it's very hard, for example, to, uh, to have everyone attending at the same time. And that's mainly because of uh, internet access and sometimes because we don't have um, uh, the appropriate place to have uh, to have the meeting. So this uh, was uh, um, had a huge hit on on the uh, participation and maintaining the engagement of local NGOs. Um, another thing that uh, we're not suffering of this uh, this year uh, is when it comes to uh, um, in person meetings and uh, participation in the annual meeting. We've seen during the last years uh, um, that it's very hard to uh, securing uh, to to secure uh, visas and allocate funding, uh, travel funding for for national NGOs, so they can participate in in face to face meetings and be more active, uh, um, and and uh, uh, participate more and have a say on on what uh, what we're doing. Um, so I think uh, um, uh, here we need like a, uh, a more, um, um, I, I would say like more encouragement from the um, uh, Alliance side and also more uh, uh, initiative and participation from the uh, uh, local NGO side is needed. Um, and I do dream or, or I aim for a day where we have uh, um, for each working group uh, to be led by one national NGO and one international NGO someday. So, so we really do own the, uh, uh, the, the alliance. But let me now take it back to you, Tasha. Like, uh, do you see any other challenges or areas to, to improve uh, in the work of the alliance? Thanks so much, Riyadh. And thanks for sharing that vision. Um, the first thing that comes to mind for me in terms of one of the major challenges that we need to face is the climate. It is one of the most pressing and urgent global issues, and it has major implications for child protection, child rights, child well-being. Our sector needs to find its foothold and engage in this issue. I mean, some of the questions that come to mind, how will we respond to the increased vulnerability of children and their families faced with climate-related hazards? Um, you know, climate change is going to have multiple interacting effects on children, their families, 
you know, food security, water security, economic security. So how can we strengthen and contribute to the systems of resilience and work more holistically across sectors? Um, as Anita was highlighting, we need to do more of that for the well-being of children in the face of climate change. Um, do we already have some evidence of effective child protection interventions that address climate um, that we can glean and synthesize and share learning already? And then the last question that comes to mind related to climate is also what is the impact on our own operations? Um, certainly the climate risk mitigation applies to our own operational capacity and reach. And how is that going to evolve due to climate change? What does that mean for our practice? So there's a host of issues that I think are, and probably many more related to climate change, that'll be important for um, the Alliance as a leading um, norm setting body and guidance setting body for child protection. And then the second thing that comes to mind in terms of an area for um, exploration is private sector. Now, I'm not talking about fundraising private sector. I'm talking about businesses and their huge impact on child rights in all settings, including humanitarian settings. So how, you know, what is our role in engaging with businesses in order to have positive outcomes for children? You know, what is, what is our role in engaging with them as influential policy makers um, and as partners in order to improve outcomes for children? Um, and address many of the child rights situations that are linked to business practices. So those are a few ideas. Um, I don't know, Anita, what, do, what would you add to the list of things that we can either build upon or improve going forward? Yeah, thank you, Tasha. I also have uh, um, two areas I would really like uh, the Alliance to um, carry forward. The first one is about uh, um, MHPSS, so mental health and psychosocial support. Um, it was very interesting in the past days uh, to see uh, how often uh, mental health, psychosocial distress, uh, and uh, uh, MHPSS services uh, were, were mentioned. I think uh, it's quite clear that uh, um, psychosocial distress uh, is one of the major protection concerns for children and their families uh, during um, infectious disease outbreaks. I know that the Alliance has already done some work on this thematic area, mainly through the Family Strengthening Task Force. And I also know that we are already collaborating with MHPSS actors um, on ad hoc uh, initiatives. What I would like to see in the future, it's maybe a more uh, comprehensive collaboration with MHPSS actors, a bit similarly to what is happening with education in order to really support uh, child protection practitioners to deliver with uh, confidence um, MHPSS services from uh, the basic to the specialized one uh, to children and their families. Another area I would like to talk about is about skill, is related to skills. Um, I think during the COVID-19 pandemic, all of us realized that the child protection practitioners required uh, retraining and reskilling to be able to adjust uh, their ways of working and, uh, um, and shift to uh, remote modalities of service provision. All of us uh, were confronted, we are still confronted with uh, um, remote management, uh, um, remote monitoring, uh, remote capacity building, remote coaching. And so this change really uh, pushed us to become more familiar with the uh, um, system used for online service provision, hotlines, uh, various apps, and also become familiar with the risk that are associated to uh, the use of all these. So um, I think it's very important to take this opportunity to reflect what are uh, the skills that are uh, um, needed for child protection practitioners to be able to deliver services uh, in uh, infectious diseases out during infectious disease outbreaks, uh, in uh, restricted environments, and specifically what are uh, the skills that we need to be able to innovate and to be able to do so while also um, respecting principles of safety and do no harm. So those are my two areas. Uh, Riyadh, we are approaching the end. I'm sure you uh, might want to share a last thought in terms of things you would like the Alliance to further strengthen going forward. Thank you. Thank you so much. I know that uh, 
uh, there's a lot to work on. Uh, but again, coming from a, lo a local NGO, I feel that I, I need to elaborate more on, on uh, localization. One thing I'd, that I would love for the Alliance to focus on is how to support uh, lo local NGOs who are outside of the, uh, the Alliance. Uh, we've done a huge work around localization, but I know that some um, uh, uh, local organizations um, don't like they can't engage with the alliance because they don't uh, have the capacity when it comes to um, uh, like policies, child safeguarding policies, and other things. So I I see the the alliance during the next three years finding a way to support them to to have this kind of structure within the, their organizations, so they are eligible to be part of uh, uh, of, of the alliance in the future. And I I understand that uh, this is a huge uh, amount of work to be done, but I really hope that it would be a priority. Thank you. And what a great note to uh, conclude our conversation on. And uh, thank you so much, Tasha, Anita, and Riyadh. Um, I obviously did the, the run through with you and I still learned in that conversation. Um, so I think you've done a really excellent job of giving us an idea of you know, where the Alliance has come from, what we as a community have achieved in the last uh, few years. And um, now I'm actually going to invite Hani and Audrey, the coordinators of the Alliance to, um, to join us and maybe tell us a little bit about, um, you know, we've looked at where we've come the last few years, our achievements, some of the things we still need to work on, where should we go next? Where do you see the Alliance going in the next few years? Great, thank you, Lael, for the question. Um, and on purpose, I'm gonna remain a little bit vague, but not too much, uh, because the idea as well is to hear from colleagues here today. So I don't want necessarily to kind of, you know, put um, on the table too much of my own thinking. I want to be a little bit surprised. But this said, I think we have today an opportunity to think uh, creatively, um, to be ambitious for the sector. Uh, and we have talked about growth and, uh, and what we have achieved. So why don't we try to be a little bit ambitious and see where we can go? Um, and being innovative as well. And by innovative is how we can use that uh, knowledge and experience we have gained over the past three years, um, including the most recent one uh, with the COVID-19 pandemic and all those technology uh, we've been through and how we can use that. And um, so my recommendation and the remote uh, work, etc. So my recommendation would be to colleagues to kind of um, think a little bit about uh, with uh, outside, sorry, think a little bit outside of the box and see uh, what could come out from those discussions today. Um, Hani, do you want to? Uh, anything about that and thanks thanks again um Lyle for pulling all of this together and, and Tasha Anita and Riyadh for a really thoughtful um kind of recap almost of of where we have come from and uh, and some of the points that you mentioned about what can be improved and what the gaps may be um yeah so a couple of um, a couple of reflections one is I want to make sure for all of us to also take a look at um, the, the strategic plan from the last three years um, and and seeing which which elements of that might remain um, still pertinent and, and relevant to to next to the next three years because in no way we would we will ever claim that just because there are priorities then of course we we did what needed to be done and, and it's over. Um, just as a reminder, the five priorities, we had three primary and two secondary priorities were localization, which Riyadh very eloquently made a case for, um, and uh, capacity building for the sector, which, which I believe Anita made a very strong case for. Um, we, we promised to work more significantly on evidence. I, I think we achieved at least part of that through the work that we did uh, with uh, 
with the minimum standards, uh, which has a much stronger evidence base in the 2019 edition. Um, prevention, which is an ongoing project that we have, um, and it's and Natasha highlighted that. Um, and multi-sectoral collaboration, again, uh, several of the colleagues, including Anita, pointed out to the, to the collaboration with education, which is ongoing. So these were some of the priorities that we had. Throughout the years, we also have focused on other things. And I saw in the, in the questions, for example, the issue of Nexus came up and what the Alliance will be doing on, on the Nexus. This hasn't been one of our priorities, but it's, it's an area that, um, that possibly requires work. Um, so I just wanted to kind of encourage everyone to kind of think about all of those, think about what the sector needs as a whole. So be very open in your, in your thinking. Don't, don't first start thinking about the Alliance, think about what the sector needs and, and from your per particular perspective, whether you sit in a headquarter or you sit in a field office. Um, and, and then hopefully towards the end of the day, we kind of make it much more concrete about what can the Alliance do in the next three years to, to move some of the priorities that you identify forward um, in the next three years or, or longer. And I just want to end on, on one note on, on the localization. It has, we actually were very, very excited because we had almost 200 local organizations that had signed up. Um, but to um, Riyadh's point that sometimes uh, connection is a, is, a, is a big issue for local organizations, um, it seems that not, not, a lot of them, not a lot of them have been able to join the actual meetings. So we were very, very excited that we're, now that we're not face to face, they might be able to more easily join, but it seems that internet is a, still a hurdle. And Audrey had this big plan of making sure that local organizations can, we can pair them up um, with uh, national organizations, international organizations that may have more capacity but because of COVID-19, that was not possible. Um, over to you, Lael, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so Hani and Audrey have uh, sort of inched us towards what I'm supposed to say next, which is introduce the exercise. However, before we do that, we have one um, last poll that sort of wraps up some of the thoughts you were sharing in the big one during the discussion. Um, so you're going to get a link right now uh, and while I introduce the facilitators uh, and the next session to you, if you want to think about um, what are some of the main ways that the Alliance has helped you in your work? So we don't want this to be a sort of, you know, global conversation only on what we're doing at this like working group level, but in your work, whether that's, you know, in a country office, whether that's in a, in a sub national location, uh, whether you're entirely focused on a community or 12 communities, what are some of the main ways the Alliance has helped you in your work? And what are some of the ways that it could help you more? So what more can we do as a global community to help each other in our day-to-day -day roles and our day-to-day -day functions and responsibilities? Um, so you're getting a poll right now. Uh, it's in the chat, perfect. <laughs> um, both questions are in there. You can answer the first one. You can scroll to the next thing. You can answer the second one. We'll show some of your answers um, on the screen. Um, and while you're doing that, I'm just going to introduce your facilitators and sort of explain what's coming up next. Um, so I think facilitators, you want to wave? You're all, I can see you all. Hopefully everyone else can see you all. Um, today, depending on which room you're in, you are going to be with Amanda, Mark, Elena, Laura, Judy. We're just informally going without last names right now. <laughs> um, and for this next hour, uh, when you reach the rooms, um, you're going to be doing an exercise and they can touch upon it again. We'll put you into breakouts. Um, and we have three questions for you to sort of think on and explore and really just have a brainstorm together in your groups. Um, we're asking, what do you think is working well in the sector? And so as you can see, we've already prompted you to start thinking about some of these things. You've been putting your answers in the menti poll. Um, and then what are some of the key challenges that we face as a sector? Uh, and then lastly, we're gonna talk about what you think our key priorities should be. So you'll have these discussions. We're asking you to sort of pick your top three answers as a group. Um, you'll come back and share in your room. And then after the break, we'll see you um, back here. Uh, I think that's it. It's been really great having you at the start of this day. And I look forward to uh, picking up again um, after the break when we come back to share some of our thoughts on those three questions.